Welcome to Death, Lies, and Alibis. I'm your host, Christy, and this is the podcast that dives deep into the dark and eerie world of local cold cases. McConnellsville is a small, lovely town nestled in the heart of Ohio. It's bustling with tight-knit neighborhoods, friendly faces, and a sense of security that you'd expect from any small town. But beneath the idyllic surface lies a hidden darkness, a collection of unanswered questions that have lingered over the years. So grab your headphones, lock your doors, and be prepared to enter a world where the truth has invaded everyone. Welcome. If you're a returning listener, welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're a new listener, welcome, and I hope you stick around till the end. Okay, today we continue with a baffling case of Craig Sirely. Let's revisit the ground we've covered in our opening two episodes. Okay, so in the first episode, we introduced Craig Sirely as more than just a case number. Craig, remembered by those who knew him as a beacon of joy and creativity, tragically had his life cut short under circumstances that left more questions than answers. We explored his vibrant life, from his passion for family and interests like weightlifting, to his significant connections within McConnellsville, painting a picture of a man loved by many. We also walked through the initial findings of the investigation into his death. On that fateful night, emergency services found Craig in his vehicle, deceased, with the situation quickly labeled as a suicide by the authorities. This swift classification sparked immediate controversy, particularly among his family and close friends who knew him as a spirited and hopeful individual, not one to take his own life. Further stirring the community's unease were the details of that night, the positioning of his body, the forensic evidence that was left at the scene, and the peculiar circumstances of the vehicle's condition. Each element we discussed pointed to a puzzle that didn't quite fit the simple explanation offered by the official reports. We dug into the ripple effects of Craig's passing on his family and the community, emphasizing the emotional aftermath. Wrapping up, we opened up about the complexities surrounding that night, hinting at the murky details yet to be explored. So in today's episode, we're shifting gears to explore the various theories, rumors, and ideas that have surfaced about Craig's case. As we sift through these possibilities, please remember, folks, these are not established facts. Each scenario represents a blend of community whispers and pieces of the puzzle that we've yet to completely understand where they fit. So everyone mentioned or implied in these discussions is considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Okay, so we're going to touch on the suicide theory just briefly. It is important to explore every angle here. Why would they think suicide? Other than what the officials called obvious evidence, the the gun, the wound. But what theory did they go with back in 1989? Well, let's dive into a love triangle theory that seems straight out of a TV drama, but it does touch closely on Craig's life. This triangle involves Craig, his longtime girlfriend, Angie, and a newer interest, Shayla, weaving a complex web of emotions that could have had dire consequences. Craig and Angie had a stable relationship for about five or six years. Now, that's a testament of a long, hard, deep relationship in a small town setting. Then Shayla came into the picture just over six months before the tragedy, introducing a new dynamic into Craig's life. So let's take a closer look at Shayla and Craig's relationship. They were together for just a little over six months before they got engaged, which seems incredibly fast, doesn't it? Well, rumors were swirling that Shayla allegedly told Craig she was pregnant right around when he was planning to break up with her. Now, was it true or is this just a nasty rumor? Shayla denies it. And what about Angie, who was really close to Craig? She mentioned in 93 that he was under a lot of stress from this new upcoming job, his relationships, and he had some family pressure going on. Is it a possibility this could have been too much for him? Even though we may 
be close to somebody. We often don't know everything that's happening in someone's life. Now, we really don't think Craig killed himself because that's not the guy everyone claims Craig was. We've got to consider this theory, though, because it, it is a theory, and they did rule that, but it we just like to cover all the bases. And we encourage thoughtful discussion and sharing of insights on this theory. You can do that on our Facebook group. And folks, you know it's important to approach these discussions with sensitivity and openness, maturity, recognizing that these are speculations based on just piecing together fragments of stories. Now, the fallout for Angie and Shayla is profound, right? I mean, Angie might have wrestled with guilt and frustration over her perceived inability to support Greg effectively. And Shayla, poor thing, she might have been haunted by guilt or remorse, pondering her role in the events leading up to Craig's death. Or could there have been another player, a mysterious figure, whose actions under the radar fuel these tensions? This isn't just about romantic complications, though. It's about understanding the profound impact personal relationships can have on our actions and decisions, especially when you're young and emotional and the hormones are testosterone. Now, while we look into this theory and our others, we understand that we don't have concrete suspects or any clear motives. We like to have a means, a motive, and an opportunity, right? Be perfect. Here we have a means and we have the opportunity, and we have several rabbit hole motives. And we hope that you can make sense of, about some of them, maybe. Take a look on our Facebook group. So before we go any further, I do want to remind everyone that what we discuss here is based on pure speculation and observations. Our discussions are not accusations at all, okay? I'm not a professional investigator, lawyer, law enforcement officer of any kind. These theories we explore are to stimulate our discussions and are not official judgments. I encourage all of you to do your own research Consider the information that I present to you, and please come to your own conclusions. Because our goal here is to have a respectful and informative discussion without causing harm or prematurely deciding someone's guilt or innocence. Okay, we don't do that. It's important for us to approach these cases with an open mind and hearts, understanding while we seek answers, we have the responsibility to do so with care for all involved. And as we keep that in mind, please, we considered the tangled emotions and potential fallout of that love triangle. Let's shift our focus to another scenario that paints a very different picture of the forces at play. This next theory takes us into the shadows of organized crime, where the stakes can get personal and deadly. This isn't your everyday small-town gossip, folks. It's about the unexpected appearances of a white limousine, which some locals link to a rumored mafia activities in nearby Duncan Falls. Now imagine this. It's a sleek white limousine parked beside the sheriff's department. Now that's an unusual sight that doesn't fit with the usual local traffic that was going on. So people start talking. Whispers turn to stories. And soon there's chatter about mysterious figures and late night meetings. Yeah, it's the stuff that late night movies are made of, but it's right here in our own backyard. This theory hinges on the belief that Craig somehow allegedly saw something or somehow got caught up with individuals connected to this alleged underworld. Now, it was a direct dangerous involvement. It's not all speculative either, because we have a 1993 statement from a community member saying they saw the limo several times, and they named four or five more people who also saw it around town. Plus, one of Craig's close friends saw it once, and also saw what was involved, and we heard it involved running guns, and it scared the pajeevers out of Craig's friend. These details from those who've seen the limo themselves suggest there's more to the story. Come on. Potentially tying back to some darker elements rumored to be in Duncan Falls. Now, why would the mafia be interested in a place like Duncan Falls or Morgan County? Did David Sirely or Craig see something connected with the crooked sheriff's deals that he had going on? 
These are questions that keep us up wondering what the hell, right? If there's truth to this, the implications could be so profound, not just for understanding Craig's untimely demise, but also for unearthing a hidden layer of crime in our seemingly tranquil areas. While it may sound like something from a TV crime drama, guys, I'm telling you, the presence of organized crime in small towns is real, and it's still an ongoing issue. These groups often choose small towns because they offer less law enforcement scrutiny, making it easier to carry out activities like smuggling or laundering, and just just goes unnoticed. One troubling method organized crime uses involves influencing local officials because by corrupting key figures through bribery or threats, criminals can secure a protective layer, allowing them to operate with a lower risk of detection. Now, this strategy isn't new, right? It echoes clear back to the Prohibition era with mobsters running bootlegging operations. And it does remain relevant today with drug cartels and traffickers. I mean, they exploit similar small-town vulnerabilities to this day. The impact on these communities is so profound, guys. It erodes the trust, and it damages the social fabric that holds them together. So I just... Want by understanding and recognizing these patterns, I just wanted you to know that this not only is something that people think up, it really does and did happen in our communities. So as we uncover more about the forces that may have touched Christ's life, we're trying to understand not just the what and the who, but also the why, the larger forces at play that it could influence such a tragic outcome. Our research did take us to news articles back in 1993 that showed the corruption we're talking about. And that's because Sheriff Nelson and several other officials, including Craig's dad, were busted for theft in office. The sheriff even did some jail time. Now, I didn't go down this rabbit hole, but it is very interesting. You can read all about it, all the articles on our Facebook group. It's on our homepage under the files section. So that's the reality, though, of a small town community in McConnellsville back in the late 80s and early 90s. And I wonder just what else was going on that was so overlooked or never uncovered. I mean, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? It really does. Okay, let's move on. Shifting from the shattery rumors of mafia involvement, we focus closer to home. What role could Craig's dad, a police officer, entangled in controversy, have played in Craig's mysterious end? Let's dive into how his profession might have influenced the events that unfolded. There's talk. Allegedly, he got mixed up in some wicked trouble because he was busting too many people for large grow operations, or he at least busted the wrong person. He was said to have loved busting people. Marijuana crops, he could smell them out. He was on, he could hunt, hunt them down. And he was awarded the highest number of drug busts in Ohio, not once, but several years in a row. But imagine, seriously, imagine the strain of such a life where your duty to uphold the law might blur with the darker sides of law enforcement. Could this shadow have reached Craig? It's not a stretch. In small towns, personal and professional lines are often intertwined, and the impact can ripple out in unexpected ways. If David was walking a dangerous path, it's crucial to understand how this tension might have seeped into Craig's life, potentially stirring up some serious trouble. Remember after Craig's death, when the family was investigating, they themselves received threats from a mysterious person on the phone. They received phone calls, telling to stop. Get your nose out of it. Whitney, now that's Craig's younger sister. She shared something really chilling with me. She overheard her dad mention that someone was keeping a close watch on the family right after the incident. They even knew what she wore to school on a Pacific day. I know. Isn't that just, oh, it gives me goosebumps. Imagine how terrifying that must have been for them, the whole family. Now, this is the kind of surveillance that could add a whole new line of questioning for the officials. The idea that people might target David through his family, like I said, that's not far-fetched. 
Sadly, it's a common tactic still in the drug world today. Revenge can take many forms, and reaching someone through their loved ones is a harsh reality in those kind of circles. This theory isn't a random guess. Actually, it's widely talked about in Morgan County. Many believe that David's involvement in risky business could very well be why Craig ended up dead. The connections might not be obvious to everyone, but for those who know how these dynamics play out, it's it's a theory that makes a lot of sense. We needed to look into this angle because if it's true, it paints a much broader picture of dangers Craig might have been inadvertently pulled into. Yeah, that's another one. All right, let's continue. Shifting away from the suspicions about David's professional life, let's turn our attention to a more personal aspect of Craig's world, looking at what first was a rumor, but it turns out we have official documents to prove part of this theory is true. And this is about steroid use. A friend of Craig's opened up to the investigator back in 1993, sharing that Craig dipped his toes into the world of the performance enhancers after hitting the gym with him. Okay, I want to set the record straight here a minute. That Craig was given steroids to be taken because of an injury to his ankle that he had to have surgery on. So Craig was legally allowed to have these steroids that he started, but then he ended up getting addicted to them and using them and abusing the steroids. And a gym in Mount Vernon called the Flex Gym, where Craig hung out a lot, there were plenty of whispers about steroids. Maybe Craig might have gotten caught up in trying to bulk up and ended up in some risky situation because of it. In Mount Vernon, hitting the gym is more than a way to stay fit. It was about a community, a lifestyle. You know how things, you know, like a biker world has their lifestyle. You know, this has their lifestyle. It was like a community of the the room, deep, deeply embraced by many there, and just not in Mount Vernon. It goes all the gyms. In such places like this, where pushing past physical limits is the name of the game, the temptation to use steroids can be sometimes, you know, really hard, really hard to turn away from. For someone like Craig, who loved to push the limits and thrived on adrenaline, the promise of quick muscle gains, well, that could have been too tempting for him to pass up. This secrecy of Craig using steroids might have piled on some stress, making him feel like he had to handle situations and hide this part of his life and be all alone. We all know we live in a world where there is intense pressure to preform and transform, and these pressures can push someone to make decisions with serious, far-reaching consequences in their lives. So did Craig find himself caught up in something that added another layer to the already complex puzzle of his life, possibly even playing a role in his mysterious death? Because there's a statement that customs, yes, customs, got involved because this drug ring with the steroids is spanned Muskingum, Morgan, and all the surrounding areas. It was a big operation which really shows you and points out how close to danger Craig might have been. We're zeroing in on a few key people who are tied to the theory that Craig might have been involved with steroids. I can't reveal their names just yet, but these individuals could be crucial to understanding the gym culture in Mount Vernon. And these about four or five people are becoming increasingly significant as we dive deeper into what might have influenced Craig's decisions and actions. So as we push forward any information you have about the environment Craig was a part of, it could be incredibly helpful. We're here to gather all the pieces and pass them on to the authorities. Whether you're confirming details or you're offering new insights or just helping to fill the gaps about Craig's social circles, your input is essential. Please trust me. If you think you have something to add, please don't hesitate to reach out. Please reach out to McConnellsville Police Department, Morgan County Sheriff's Department. Together, we can make sure we're covering every angle of Craig's story. It's also interesting, I want to point out here, just a quick note, that the Akron Police Department, they showed up to dig into Craig's case. Because remember, Craig had just been accepted to the department, but he hadn't started working here yet. And they were so deeply invested in him that they wanted to find out what happened, too. 
We'll have some documents and files available for you to look over and look at, and you can find them on our Facebook group. I have been in touch with witnesses, officials, and some law enforcement to gather more insight into Craig's case. I have communicated and corresponded with Sheriff McGrath, and I'm currently just hoping and praying that he will talk with uh, Craig's family members. We're hoping that once he hears the full story and reviews the evidence that the family has gathered, he'll agree that this case deserves a deeper look. It deserves to be open and looked at. I think it's solvable. I really do. So after exploring the steroid angle, we're nearing the end of our deep dive into Craig's story. From a tangled love triangle to whispered connections with the mafia, the possibility of a revenge on a cop, And the impact of steroid use, we've covered a lot of ground. And as we wrap up our in-depth exploration into the mysterious case of Craig Sirely, it's time to reflect on the journey we've taken together through these three revealing episodes. From the initial shock and confusion over his sudden death, labeled too quickly as a suicide, to unraveling the complex web of his personal relationships and community theories, each episode has peeled back layers of this profound mystery. In our first episode, we revisited who Craig was, more than just a statistic, but a vibrant soul whose life ended under murky circumstances. We questioned the quick label of suicide, given his hopeful nature and his deep community ties in McConnellsville. Our second episode dived into the dramatic turn of events when Craig's death certificate was changed from suicide to undetermined. This shift acknowledged the unresolved questions and controversies discussed in the court hearing. We also shared crucial visuals from the crash site and discussed evidence that was overlooked initially alongside interviews with key witnesses, all of which we have posted on our Facebook group. Today, we discuss the various theories and rumors that have surfaced over the years, love triangles, possible mafia connections, and the effects of steroid use, reminding everyone these are speculative and not definite truths. Each scenario provided us with a possible glimpse into the factors that might have influenced Craig's tragic end. As we conclude this series, it's clear the full truth about Craig's demise remains unsolved. Each theory we've examined adds another dimension to the story, highlighting the deep aspects of human relationships and the potential for external pressures to lead to tragedy. This is not the end, however. The conversation must continue, folks, in our communities, online, and within the legal system for sure. Justice for Craig means not letting his story disappear into the shadows. We must keep the dialogue open, question the answers, and pursue deeper truths that might still be uncovered. It's your turn. It's your turn to weigh in and help unravel these tangled threads. Let's bring everything we've discussed into the light and see where the truth might lead us. We've laid out the suspicions, the secrets, and the evidence, and now it's up to us. It's up to us to reach out to the authorities, let them know that we have all of this, and please, please take another look at it. And hey, folks from Morgan County, you have truly made a difference by joining our death, lives, and alibis community. Your involvement has significantly advanced our efforts, drawing attention to not only Christ's case, but also to previous cases we spotlighted and to future investigations we plan to feature. Your contributions have been invaluable in our journey to uncover the truth. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you from the crew at Death, Lies, and Alibis. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of Death, Lies, and Alibis. We hope that by shining a light on these local cold crimes, we spark something within you, our listeners. Because the truth is, solving these cases will take more than just our words. It's going to require the dedication and collective efforts of the entire community. 
Don't forget to hit the follow button on the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. And she'll learn more about how to get your case featured on the show or to get instant access to case files and reports. Plus, we have many documents and free resources. Go to our Facebook group, Death, Lies, and Alibis, and join today. Or you can email us at deathliesandalibis at gmail.com. As always, be safe, stay alert, and never stop seeking justice. Thank you.